Welcome to this month's uh, webinar. My name is Dave Ripplinger, uh, Extension Economist with NDSU Extension. Uh, this is our monthly webinar, Agricultural Market Situation and Outlook. Uh, as usual, we have a number of uh, extension specialists uh, working economics are going to give you updates on different things happening in their field with questions at the end. Uh, we encourage you to ask those questions uh, either using the Q&A tool or the chat tool, but it really is your opportunity to engage more uh, with us and the topics that we have for you this week and any other uh, questions you might have. But with that, I'll turn it over to Brian Parman. Oh, thanks, Dave. Um, so I'm going to get my screen share up here in a moment, but um, what I wanted to uh, say, you know, last time we I talked about um, fertilizer prices and and some other production costs, kind of where they sat last fall. This time I'm mostly just going to do an, an an inflation overview and and sort of where we're at with that and rates. Um, not super in depth uh, next week. And Dave's going to hit on it. We have our lenders conference where I'm going to go much more in depth into a lot of these topics I'm going to talk about today. But uh, for now, just sort of a highlights from the uh, report. Um, that just came out uh, today and some of the reports that came out um, last week. So the the inflation report that came out this morning from the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, the consumer price index, it was the it was a little bit higher um, than on, only one tenth of one percentage point higher than what the trades expected. Uh, but what's what's kind of happened here is the last three months, the overall or headline inflation has uh, has leveled off, you know, between 3.5 and 3.7 percent uh, for the last three months. And this is where it stood uh, uh, this morning on all items, 3.7 industry expectations were 3.6. So pretty close. And then that core inflation number uh, is been pretty stubborn at, at hanging out above above four percent. And that's a number, again, that the Fed's target on, on inflation is 2%, both core and uh, and headline inflation. And if we recall, just a reminder, core inflation uh, takes, it says, you can see at the bottom, all items, less food and energy. And that was 4.1%. And then I wanted to show uh, food inflation has been a, been a hot topic uh, for the last year or so as we've seen prices uh, change. And I got a, I got a table here coming up that that shows uh, specific categories uh, of meats but uh cereals and and bakery products that, that those products remain uh that their prices have continued to increase as well as uh, non-alcoholic beverages and, and materials as well dairy related products the, the inflation year over year has actually fallen and then meat fish poultry eggs has, has, is pretty flat, uh, very close to uh, where those prices were last year. And so the BLS also pulls out, you know, these specific items for for uh, food food categories, not just food in general, but the overall food cost. Ground beef, and this is a percentage change from September of last year. So from September of last year to September of this last year. And and as an aside, that, that report that comes out, it's always a month behind. So the, the report that came out this morning was... Uh, for September. Oops. So ground beef's up about 8%, roast, yeah, beef roast up almost 9%, and then sirloin steaks uh, up about 9% as well. Interestingly, bacon was actually down uh, right now or, or in, in September, year over year, down 8%, uh, whereas uh, some other pork items like pork chops up 3.5% and then ham up almost 10%. Some of the fresh chicken, for the most part, about the same uh, whole chicken, uh, breasts and stuff as well, mostly, but leg bone in legs down uh, considerably. So your drumsticks are a lot cheaper. Big one, eggs. We remember that egg prices had had uh, just skyrocketed. So the decline in egg prices essentially is just the market. Uh, you know, we there was a little bit of a short supply on eggs, concerns about illness running through the U.S. flock. Well, and obviously Tim can comment on that a lot more than I can. It, it follows it more closely. But as that's come into line, uh, we've seen eggs down uh, 30 percent year over year from September of 22 to 23. Cheese down a little bit. Uh, and unfortunately for you, beer and wine drinkers up 10 percent for both of those products almost 
uh, since last year. So, but by and large, food prices, um, um, you know, if you go back to this slide here, overall up 3.7%, essentially mirroring um, overall uh, headline inflation. Now, another thing that's being talked about, and this is one of the bigger drivers, uh, one of the things that's really pushing uh, this, this yearly price increases are home prices. And this is the home price index uh, from, the, from the Federal Reserve. And as of July, uh, the home price index had reached an all-time high. So shelter is a big category in the inf and when they do that consumer price index. And with home prices continuing to hit new heights, uh, that's one of the things that's driving and one of the reasons why that inflation number just is pretty sticky. And, and we've gotten down to three, three and a half percent, and it's just kind of not budging much below that. And a big reason why there, especially on the core inflation side, is this uh, shelter costs. And that one thing, though, that that is concerning, well, the, here's a couple of concerning factors going forward. And, you know, I'm not going to spend a ton of time uh, uh going over it now, and, and I will at our, our lenders conference next week a lot more, but the producer price index, which is upstream items, you know, uh, the, the producers uh, producers of goods that are going to eventually sell them to consumers, make them or whatever, that inflation number is remaining pretty pretty stubborn um, and, and, and has actually increased uh, 2%, uh, uh, up to over 2%, which was concerning for those uh, for that producer price index. And then this situation, so you got the home prices um, stubbornly uh, continuing to, to march upward. But the other situation is in the labor uh, market. And that's the fact that as of right now, there are 0 0.7 unemployed people per job opening. In other words, there are far more job openings than there are people to fill those jobs. And you go back to the last time we had a big recession. I'm not talking about COVID, which is the spike you see right there under over August 2020. But you go back to August of 2009, 2010, the Great Recession, uh, we call it. There were six unemployed people per job opening. OK, and a lot of what drives recessions and, and what recessions are made of is, is unemployment. And I've, I've mentioned it not just on this webinar, but but out speaking abroad, that uh, one of the things that causes people to slow down their spending is fear of losing their job or fear of being laid off or uh, struggling to find a job. Well, that's just not the case right now. So because of this fact that it tends to be a worker friendly labor market, folks just aren't afraid to spend, even with higher interest rates. Um, and then and then. Uh, you know, if, if you're not afraid of losing your job or you're not afraid of your wages being stagnant as wages have continued to march upwards, uh, you know, you keep spending and, and then that's one of the, the, the issues with inflation. But the, And then the last thing I want to say about it is the conversation for the most part uh, recently has changed from how high will interest rates go to how long are they going to stay where they're at right now or at or around, you know, because a lot of the consumer rates are over 8% uh, as well as um, commercial. And so even if the Fed did increase interest rates another or the federal funds rate another quarter of a percent, which would probably drive interest rates up a little bit more, maybe or maybe not. Um, the, the question is now shifted because to, OK, well, how long do they have to remain this high? Now, my opinion on that is uh, largely until they have to bring them down. And I think that realization is starting to set in, which is why you're seeing some of these uh, treasuries like the 10-year yield starting to creep up as folks are starting to perhaps realize that these rates are here to stay for a while. I don't know how long a while is, but this talk of cutting rates you know, next spring or next summer is starting to subside largely. And I would ask, you know, to conclude on that, if if the if the objective is to maintain inflation at two percent, and it or a target of two percent, and right now it's three point seven, what do you think would happen if the Fed suddenly slashed the federal funds rate from five and a half down to two or one percent, and interest rates plummeted? What 
what does everyone think would happen in that scenario? And I think we all agree we would see inflation shoot way up right away. I mean, within a matter of month, a few months, it would start surging again. So when when you're thinking about how long are these rates going to stay elevated, um, I guess I would ask you, if I were you, I'd ask myself, well, what would happen if they cut them today or next week or something like that? What do you think would happen under that scenario? And that's why, you know, I think that realization is is coming. So like I said, uh, if you are coming to our lenders conference um, next week, I'm talking about this much more in depth and a whole bunch more topics on the macro side, as well as our ag finance outlook. But just a, just a brief report on what this latest um, uh, information and the data coming out from uh, from a month ago. Just wanted to hit on that for anyone who, who isn't going to be with us next week. So with that, I am I am finished. I'm going to stop sharing. I'll answer beyond to answer a few questions toward the end, like always. Um, and I'm going to go ahead then and turn it over to uh, Frayne Olson. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Frayne Olson. I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the report that came out today, or actually the two reports that came out today. Um, the WASD, which is the World Agricultural Supply Demand Estimates, and then the production reports. Uh, before I jump into that, um, I do want to talk about a couple key market things that are going on. These are questions that I'm going to get, I know, throughout the next several weeks, so I thought I'd try and hit them head on first. Uh, so to summarize very quickly before we dive into the exact numbers, uh, the USD reports that came out at 11 o'clock today were considered positive for soybeans. I think we're already seeing that in the markets. We're up about 39 or 40 cents on November soybeans right now. Um, it's slightly positive for corn. Um, I think it turned the, the kind of the mentality and the shifting of the corn market to more of a positive tone than a negative tone. Uh, uh, corn, December corn is up about eight to nine cents right now. It was actually, the numbers were slightly negative for wheat, even though spring wheat is up about seven right now uh, for December uh, spring wheat. Um, it, actually, the numbers were slightly negative. Some of that we had already experienced uh, knew about because of the September small grains report. We'd already got kind of a preview to what was going on. Um, I do think the reason we're up a little bit in wheat right now is more in sympathy with corn and soybeans. Um, and we had some slightly positive news when we look at the global wheat front. Uh, but I guess if I were to look at and, and isolate the numbers for wheat only, I'd say they're slightly negative. Um, the other thing as we move forward in time, uh, and I'm going to be spending some time, as as Brian talked about in our in our Ag Lenders Conference, is talking about the export market, um, in particular now for corn and soybeans. Uh, U.S. corn exports are actually off to a pretty good start this this year. When we compare where we are right now relative to what we saw last year, uh, corn exports are slightly ahead of the pace we saw last year, which is a good thing. We've had some really nice export sales, in particular into into uh, Mexico. However, for soybeans and wheat. That export pace is slower than last year. Uh, now the soybean export levels last year were not great, but they weren't horrible. Uh, unfortunately for wheat, uh, they weren't great. And so as we think about what's happening in the dynamics in the marketplace, um, the, the soybean export pace I think is because of the very large Brazilian crop. Um, the Chinese are still pulling their most of their soybeans uh, from that Brazilian market. They will eventually switch to U.S. beans, uh, but the fact that they had such a large crop has extended their export window, uh, allowing the Brazilians to supply the Chinese market to a longer time period than norm normally would. And that is going to put a damper on the U.S. soybean export outlook. Uh, for wheat, uh, again, just the, the world wheat dynamics is kind of unusual right now. And, and the U.S. is still a bit high priced relative to some of the other suppliers. Um, so I do think we have the capacity to start increasing some export sales, uh, but we're going to have to wait, be, be a little bit patient and wait for probably until into late November or December before that happens. Um, I am getting some questions about what's happening now with uh, between this conflict between Israel and Gaza. I'm calling it a conflict. You could call it a war. It depends upon who you talk to. So far, it's had relatively limited impacts on the grain markets, but that may change if the contract conflict grows, if, if the number of countries involved it starts to expand and this grows into a larger conflict than basically being isolated right within the Gaza region, that could obviously change the dynamics significantly. 
Um, or if it continues for an extended period of time, if this thing kind of drags out for a while, the concern is first would first impact would be on grain shipping or grain shipment because of the congestion in the Mediterranean um, Ocean, as well as the Suez Canal. Now that that's Suez Canal handles a lot of oil shipments, energy shipments, not so many grain shipments, uh, but it does have an impact if you think about uh, wheat shipments or corn shipments from Ukraine or Russia into the Indian market or into the Chinese market. They usually try and go through the Gaza, the the Suez Canal as a shortcut to try and save some time and some some cost. Um, the other possibility, again, if this extend expands geographically or extends for a long period of time, uh, Egypt is the largest wheat buyer in the world. Uh, obviously, a next door neighbor to what's going on. We have the North African nations as well as the other Middle East uh, nations like Iran, Iraq, as well as Afghanistan. And all of those areas do buy off the global market, buy a tremendous amount of wheat, primarily hard red winter wheat. Uh, and, and the U.S. isn't a huge shipper or a huge, that's not a huge market for U.S. wheat anymore, uh, but it would have an impact globally on the supply demand conditions for global wheat. Um, just a quick update on uh, Ukrainian grain movements. Uh, they continue to be challenged. Uh, there continues to be some drone strikes. Uh, the Russians are sending drones across and trying to hit the, the grain facilities and export facilities in Odessa, which is still open for business right now, as well as some of the facilities, in particular grain shipments out of the Danube River. So the Danube River, which starts kind of in, in Central and, e and Western uh, Europe, runs into the Black Sea. Um, and they can use that for barge traffic. So the, the fact that these drone attacks continue to, to cause problems have really kind of hampered the ability of the Ukrainians to ship large volumes of grain. They are trying to get some safe shipping routes, some cleared routes through the Black Sea, because that is the cheapest and most effective way to get grain out of the region. Uh, but there's still been some stumbling blocks and some issues there. Um, Recently, there was a, a, a Ukrainian vessel that was that ran over a mine and, and exploded. Now, fortunately, there was no casualties, but the, the ship was damaged and it caused some problems and, of course, increased the anxiety. And just one more thing for the folks that deal in the pulse markets. Uh, there is an ongoing dispute between Canada and India over the meat, uh, murder of a sheik uh, separatist. Uh, it, in British Columbia. And so there's there's this political tensions going on between India and Canada right now, which is now spilling over into the agricultural sector. Um, the largest potential ag trader, uh, tr uh, agricultural trade impact would be for the Canadian pulse crops. Um, now, we, we are both a competitor and a supplier of pulse crops into Canada. Um, so this could have some either positive or negative impacts on U.S. pulse crops primarily field peas or lentils, depending upon how you want to interpret what's going on. Just as a sidebar, just as a reference point, India buys approximately 1.4 billion Canadian dollars of pulses from Canada, and approximately 50% of the Saskatchewan lentil crop goes directly to India. So this is a big deal for the Canadians. Um, it is something to watch because there could be some spill up, spillover uh, pressure or spillover opportunities into the U.S. pulse market, depending upon how all this plays out. So diving into the numbers, let's start with the production numbers. Again, two reports that came out today. One is the world supply and demand estimates, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, the second was an update on the production reports. So in both September and October, uh, USDA has three sources of data they use to try and estimate what yields are going to be. One of them is a farmer survey. The second is using sensor, uh, sensory data or satellite imagery to try and um, estimate what yield potential is. And the third, starting in September and October, is actually ground truthing it. They send people out for what they call objective yield surveys. They have people that they hire to go out and do a yield estimate very similar to what a crop adjuster would do. So to explain this table very quickly, we have corn and soybeans. The highlighted blue on the very top is the average trade estimate. So this is the number that the traders and private analysts were expecting to see. This was kind of a summary of their forecast of what USDA was going to de develop. Uh, towards the kind of towards the bottom, highlighted in black was last month's numbers. So this is the information we got last month. And on the very bottom in red, highlighted in red, is the current estimates, the ones that came out today. So I usually recommend that we compare the blue numbers to the red numbers. 
Um, we were expecting a slight retraction or a re reduction in yields. We did get those. The yields for both corn and soybeans were slightly more aggressive. The cuts were more aggressive than we first saw or first were expecting. And so as a result, uh, not only was the average yield lowered, but then that translates into total production. Now, one other thing that, that we have to be concerned about moving forward, of course, is we also at the very end of September had the closeouts, the final inventory numbers for last year's production. So when we do a survey in September to find out what the September 1 ending stocks are, that becomes the ending stocks for, um, for both corn and soybeans. So those numbers we got in September are now rolled into these supply and demand estimates. So we've got a bunch of changes going on, not only a change in yield forecast, but also a change in the inventories available from last year that we're gonna bring into this marketing year. So reduction of, of yields, this is what we expected. The reductions were a little bit larger than, than we had first anticipated. So as we think about what does that do to the forecast for ending stocks in the current marketing year? So now we're focusing on the crop that is being harvested right now. We're thinking about 12 months forward and saying, well, how much green do we think we're going to have in the bin this time next year? Okay. And it's that number that we start bouncing up and down and try, try and say, are we going to, are we rationing? Is the pricing system rationing our inventories uh, adequately, or do we need to increase or decrease prices to try and get the right balance? So once again, the highlighted blue on the very top is what the trade was expecting to see. This was their private estimates of what USDA is going to release. The highlighted uh, or bolded black is what we saw last month. And then the October numbers highlighted in red is what we actually got. And so if you look at the amount of wheat we expect to have in inventory just before harvest of next year, that actually went up. Now we were expecting an increase uh, for twofold. Number one, the yield forecast for wheat went up because of the um, uh, the small grains report. And we had a little bit more wheat over, left over from last year coming into this year. So our, our beginning inventories increased a little bit. The production levels were a little bit higher than we, we had first expected last month. And so as a result, our bottom line increased. Now, the increase in wheat was a bit larger than expected. Thus, the reason I said that I think there is a this would be a slightly negative tone into the wheat market. For corn, if you compare the blue versus the red, we were expecting a cut, a slight reduction in the corn ending stocks. We did get that a little bit larger than we had expected, but well within what the trade was expecting to see. So again, slightly positive. When we look at the soybean numbers, uh, the number was basically unchanged from last month. And that was a bit of a surprise, I think. Uh, a lot of folks were expecting a slight increase in the soybean ending stocks number, primarily because we had a few more soybeans from last year we were going to carry forward into this year. And so um, as a result, you know, they were expecting the ending stocks to go up, but we had a little bit larger reduction or cut in yields than we had first expected. So as a, you know, the net of that, we're basically unchanged. The other thing that I do want to comment on on the soybean side is that USDA did lower their forecasts for exports. So for the export season now in 2023-24, they did decrease their, their year-end totals, what they expected to see throughout the year. And I think the reason because of that is because the, the kind of the slow start that we're getting to our soybean export season right now. Um, I do on my last couple of slides here want to, to make a few comments about what's going on in Mississippi River levels. Uh, this is We had a problem about this time last year developing. It looks as though that we're going to have a repeat or part two of that particular story. Um, so I wanted to give you some insights into what's going on. And the reason I'm doing this is that there can be some indirect or spillover effects in what's happening through our with our grain shipments through the Mississippi River. So this is the river level at Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee. So this is, again, the, the challenge we're having is in what they call the lower Mississippi. It's that basically from St. Louis south is that stretch of the river they call the lower Mississippi. Um, and because of, of very dry conditions for the drain uh, drainage area of the Mississippi, that, that region now is experiencing some very low water levels. The reason the, the, the so the water levels, the, the reason they're low is of course the rainfall, but that's causing challenges for barge movements. And what we typically see, and I'll show you some graphics in just a moment, 
we typically see about the time that harvest gets rolling, um, a lot of the corn and soybeans that have been sold for export for kind of harvest delivery time period, the, the flow of that grain from the, the field into the local elevator, into a barge, and finally into an export facility to be loaded onto a vessel is pretty well scheduled. We know the plus or minus what the flow of grain is going to look like. And so the fact that we're seeing these lower river levels, the fact that our barge traffic and the ability of the barge system to be able to move grain into the exports at the, at the Louisiana Gulf uh, caused some problems last year, but it's also going to cause some problems again this year. The real question is, how long will these problems last? And and of course, nobody knows that because it's really going to take some recharge of the rainfall and actually for some pretty significant rainfall uh, for those Mississippi River levels to increase again. So this just shows, you know, just like we have here in the north, when we think about flood stage, we have normal river river levels that kind of vary within a particular range. If the river level gets above a, tr a trigger point, they consider that it's in, in minor flood stage or moderate flood stage. Well, we have the same thing for low water levels. So the minus five feet. So basically we're five feet below the normal levels we see um, is considered this low stage where transportation and, and other usage of the river becomes an issue. We're now minus 11 feet. And the forecast going forward is that that's not going to change. Um, and this is causing problems because we have sandbars that start sh showing up. Uh, there has to be dredging that goes on. The barges cannot be loaded to their full weight. So the barge has a draft. So the more you put, more grain you put in into it, the lower it sinks into the river. Well, you can't load it as heavy because even though there's water flowing, that water level is so low, you might get grounded very easily. And so the traffic is causing, the, the slower traffic is causing some problems. Fortunately, we do get weekly updates on grain movements through the USDA Grain Transportation Report. Uh, that comes out every Friday. This is the information from last Friday. So I just took a snapshot of what's going on. This is the grain, the barge movements for grain at Granite City, uh, Illinois. So this is a little bit further up the river, but it does give us an idea of the breakdown of not only the volume being shipped, but also the type of products being shipped. So the black line on top, that single line is the three-year average of grain movements through that particular lock, lock 27. Um, and then we, we have the bars, which is this most recent information. So starting in October 1 of last year, running through, of course, the end of September this year. And as you can see, you know we have, depending upon the time of year, we have about an equal split between corn and soybeans. Uh, but there are times when soybeans are a little heavier shipped than corn and vice versa. So notice that that when we compare the bars to what the black line is, which is normal, uh, for the last several months, we have slower than normal shipping. Now, part of that can be our export pace, but also part of that is, of course, the river levels and the ability of the barges to be able to move that product at, to, to the destination, which is Louisiana Gulf. Um, now, barge freight rates. So this is not only the volumes being shipped, but what's the cost of shipping? So the green dotted line is what we saw last year. So this is the freight rates per barge uh, moving from the St. Louis, Missouri loading point into Louisiana Gulf ports. Okay, so the dotted green line is 2022. The uh, dotted red line is the five-year average. And then those bl blue bars is what we're seeing now in 2023. So every week we get an update on barge freight rates, and it does vary depending upon where you are within the river system, uh, whether you're on the Ohio River, the, the Illinois River, or the Mississippi. Um, so this is just a reference point just to give you an idea. We're now starting to see those barge rates increase very similar pace to what we saw last year because we had a similar problem with barge, uh, with low water levels and barge traffic this time last year. So it looks like we're going to have version two of the same story. Um, the reason this becomes significant for our area is that if this continues long enough, if the barge rates get high enough, the first thing is to shift over and try and transport by rail freight rather than by barge, which is going to be more expensive, but at least you can get the vessels loaded. But if this continues for an extended period of time, what happens is the origin, the loading point for some of these grain products may shift from the Louisiana Gulf um, into the PNW. 
Now there are, we do have some golf port uh, facilities in Houston, Galveston. They're smaller facilities. They tend to handle larger volumes of wheat relative to corn and soybeans versus the Louisiana Gulf is primarily ex almost exclusively corn and soybeans. Um, so we, we can shift some, some kind of loading points around, uh, but the PNW becomes a really good alternative depending upon where the buyer is at. If you're going to take grain and ship it into the Asian markets like a China or Korea, Japan, or even South Asia, the PNW makes a really nice alternative. But if you're moving into, let's say, uh, the European markets or into some of the African markets, the PNW is, I mean, the, the Gulf, Texas Gulf is actually a better loading facility. So we may start to see as, we, as this continues on, we may start to see, like we did last year, some improved basis levels uh, for corn and soybeans um, just after harvest, uh, once we know about how, what the volumes are and be, be able to reroute some of those vessels. So keep your eyes and ears open. I'll be talking about this again um, as, as the conditions develop. My last slide, I also wanted to give you an idea of the relative size and the shipping rates for the different major ports we have. I just talked about Louisiana Gulf, um, which, is, which is really the blue line. They call it Mississippi Gulf, but it's, it's Mississippi, Louisiana. Um, so that would be the New Orleans uh, loading facilities. So the dark blue line, the solid line is where, we at, where we're at right now. The dotted line is the three-year average. When we look at that, that kind of goldish yellow uh, um, line, that would be for the Pacific Northwest. And again, the solid line is where we're at right now versus the dotted line is where we have been in the last three-year average. And then the light blue is the Texas Gulf. So that'd be the Galveston-Houston ports. And you can see the relative size of those. Uh, but you can also notice that for all of the ports, we're a little bit behind what we would normally see this time of year. And part of that is, again, our soybean shipments and that we don't have kind of that surge of export demand for soybeans. But if you do notice what we saw this time last year, uh, again, we had, so if you go back into this time period here into this uh, early October frame, we were at a kind of a similar point where we were a little bit behind and we suddenly saw a surge, but not only a surge of exports through the Mississippi Gulf or Louisiana Gulf, but also then through the PNW. And so, I mean, if history repeats itself, if we have some similar conditions, I guess I would anticipate that we'd have something like that happen again. So again, keep your eyes and ears open. Um, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions, but for right now, I'm going to stop my presentation here and I will turn things over to Tim Petrie. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie here again with you, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Just going to talk a little bit about the fall calf situation. Uh, our big runs in the North Dakota have not started yet. There are some other states to the south where they're getting more, but a uh, particular West River, we had, uh, you know, adequate forage conditions and so on. I realized dry to the north. But anyway, uh, not many cattle coming. The USDA does report uh, three markets when the runs hit here in North Dakota. That's at Napoleon, Mandan, and Dickinson. And last week only reported uh, Mandan and, and Dickinson. But, you know, they'll start pretty soon now reporting all three markets. And so uh, there are some trends already showing up that I would like to talk to you about that, you know, influences marketing and, and some of our education is going to be in the future. So uh, start off with that purple uh, circle there in the middle of the chart. That's for 550 to six weight steers. And you see at those two markets, there were only 79 head. So uh, very few. And, you know, pretty soon there will be hundreds uh, there. Uh, but. Uh, if you uh, look, uh, uh, you know, at a trend I want to talk about, as usual, heifers are discounted quite severely this time of the year. And uh, uh, Brian and I are going to be on a backgrounding webinar here in a few weeks. The date hasn't been set, and he'll be talking more about budgets, and we'll be talking about this. But from a backgrounding standpoint, again, uh, heifers are a, I, I'm assuming we're going to keep back a lot of heifers like we always do uh, from a backgrounding situation, and you know a good uh, you know a good double thing we can do there is even keep them longer, make replacement heifers out of them or whatever. But anyway, discounted thirty dollars there. You go down to the bottom, the purple there. Those nine hundred and twenty-five heifers are only discounted five dollars compared to their steer counterparts so that really helps on a backgrounding situation when you're com 
uh, you know, uh, gaining. And I'll talk a little bit about steer backgrounding in, in a minute. But look forward to that uh, webinar that we're going to present. It'll be in the news media and so on. The other thing is, of course, uh, you know, on my charts that I show you, I just do the average. I'll show you the 550 to 6 steer calf in a minute, the average 285 there again in the in the middle. But again, there's a range in prices already, 280 to 291. And I think for sure that is going to widen out as, uh, you know, we get more and more uh, cattle and some are weaned and no shots and all the things that affect the market. The other thing I want to comment on is down in the to the lower left a little bit that green circle there is you see that the fleshy cattle are being discounted quite severely they're on 775 weight steers the average uh they're at 255 and the fleshy's down at 225 so keep that in mind in your backgrounding program again i know you want them to to gain weight and uh, and do well and that's very good but just don't get them too fleshy because it's a double whammy. You're paying for the expensive feed and at the same time uh, getting a discount. To move along then, here are the 550 to six weight uh, calf prices. And again, doing much better, $78 or so higher than last year. And, uh, you know, kind of the question is, what are our expectations now for the rest of the fall? And so the big things that affect calf prices, uh, Corn prices, and Frayne talked about some of that, and I'll just mention it a little bit in, in a minute. Uh, the availability of wheat grazing is a, another factor that comes into play. Uh, corn belt buyers, when they're harvesting corn uh, like they are now or will be, they are not in the market. Those corn belt buyers pay up. They like our, our high-quality calves up here, and they just outbid the uh, corporate feedlot buyers down in Nebraska and so on. So that helps spark the market. And then as more and more calves become weaned, then they bring higher value too. So usually in the middle of October, that arrow down there, the last three years on this chart, again, the green is 2020, purple 2021, uh, 2022 is blue and the red is this year. And that'll be all my cattle charts here that I show you that uh, then we do pick up. And so, uh, you know, the heavy run hasn't started yet. So I think we are going to see uh, some continued weakness here the next a couple of weeks, uh, several weeks until we get um, more of an idea of what wheat grazing will be and get the corn belt buyers and, and the wean calves in and so on. But still, we're supported at a much higher level than last year. And so that is good news there. Uh, so looking, you know, like I mentioned, some of those things that affect the market. Here's Omaha corn prices on top. I like to use Omaha, because that's, uh, you know, where the feedlots are that buy our cattle. Keep in mind that adage on the top there, change corn 10 cents a bushel, change fall calf prices a buck in the opposite direction. So certainly a corn uh, $7 last year and under five this year is supportive to calf prices. One of the reasons why they're as high as they are. And, and of course, the four straight years of, of beef cow herd liquidation, and we have lower calf crops as well. But Corn started the year at seven, now down at, at 482. Uh, another thing I want to mention on corn, it's kind of small, but there's an ethanol plant up above there uh, where it says number two yellow corn in the blue line. That was their uh, bid for corn today, October delivery for a central North Dakota ethanol plant at 434. Compared to that to corn prices down in Omaha, which are 50 cents higher, that's why we background a lot of cattle up here because uh, feed is cheaper, corn is cheaper, and they want to buy the 800 pounders, not those lightweight calves. So we background them up here and 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 uh, again, more on that in a minute and even more on it when we do our backgrounding webinar. On the bottom, so that's corn prices are, have been supportive to calf prices. On the other hand, we go down to winter wheat and uh, the winter wheat prospects are not real good right now. That purple a circle there shows where the winter wheat, major winter wheat pasture would be that they go to. And it is dry. Half the winter wheat is in dry, but so we're hopeful to get some rains down there so they can get that winter wheat up. And then that would spark the, help spark the calf market later on as well. So here's the heavier weight yearling prices. Again, the same uh, trend in prices and, you know, $70, $75 higher than uh, last year, but they the seasonal peak, you see that down below, is always right in September. And so we, 
we've likely seen the seasonal peak again for these 750 to 800 pounders. But you see the futures market there for October and November is supported there. And so, uh, you know, at, at around 252 or, or uh, whatever on the futures market. Uh, speaking of the futures market, I've been getting quite a few questions about why on September 15th did the funds, uh, you know, they're, everybody's blaming the funds bailing out of the, of the cattle market. And so that's what caused the price to go down. And yes, the, the funds were along the cattle market a long time and they did uh, do us some profit taking there. But there are very fundamental reasons why the market uh, went down using the October feeder cattle here. And I'm comparing that to the CME cash index. The CME cash index is what the futures market is settled at. And in, in this case, uh, on October 26 is the last Thursday of the month when the October contract will close. All open contracts then will be closed at the cash settlement price. More on what that cash settlement uh, index price is in a minute. I'll show you exactly how it's computed. But just go back to September 15th there. September 15th, futures were 265. The cash market was 253. So the futures had a $12 uh, premium to the cash market and they got to be the same on October 26th. So that was one of the reasons they went down. Another reason is that corn has had a little moderate uptick here since September, the low on September 15th, went up 25 to the 30 cents. And so those are fundamental reasons why the market went down. And then in fact, you see the futures market even got below the cash market, uh, mainly because of the war there that Frain just mentioned and the idea there that you know, fed cattle, the meat prices could be affected in fed cattle and so on. But they are up yesterday were virtually identical there. The futures that, you know, they're a little over 250 and and uh, the cash settlement price there at 149.70. They're, they're right together now. Now the, the October futures are up today, closed at 252, up a little higher. And, and so you'll see that. But, you know, there there is a good reason why futures as of now, we won't rally back up to 265 as long as that cash market is down there right around uh, the, the 250 area. And so a little bit more on that, what that people ask me, what is that CME? How do they do that? How does the CME come up with that price? Well, it is a very transparent thing. It's on the CME website every day. The, the uh, website is showing up there. And I just pulled the one from last Thursday to compare to this Thursday. Uh, those are the markets re reported by USDA. And, and what the CME does is just take all the markets reported by USDA market reporters on that given day, total up all the seven weight to 899 weight medium and large frame number one and two steers that are sold. And it's a weighted average at all those markets. You see Dickinson was reported. Uh, last Thursday, I suppose, I think maybe Napoleon has reported today. So both of them will show up next Thursday. But anyway, they just total up all the cattle sold, their weight, uh, you know, in that weight category of 7 to, to uh, eight ninety nine, dollars a price at each market on the right-hand side. And at the bottom, they have a daily price, which last Thursday was two forty six eighteen, but the actual cash settlement price is a seven day uh, average. And so then they average those seven days and it was 250 41. So it's transparent. You can just go there and see that. And I guarantee you that on October 26, the October futures and this cash settlement price, price will be within 50 cents or less of each other. The other important thing about the CME uh, feeder cattle index is that's the price that USDA RMA uses to close out all over 600, the 600 to 1,000 pound feeder cattle contracts is that one price there. So uh, that's very important for LRP contracts. So more on that in a minute. Uh, again, we're going to do a, in our backgrounding budget, uh, uh, webinar that we have, uh, Brian is going to do a lot more budgeting. We do have a, a budget on our website, and I just, for information purposes of the day to talk a little bit more about LRP. I just 
I brought one up. This isn't the one on the website because you can change it and everybody's costs are different. But I just, uh, you know, took a 550 steer up to 800 pounds, uh, $300 in, which is kind of a little bit higher than the market. But I want to be, you know, somewhat conservative here and 250 out, which is uh, a little conservative, too, because, you know, March futures are uh, above that right now up there. And so uh, anyway, uh, I'm not going to go through all these numbers, just get to the bottom line so I can move along here. Uh, with those factors, and again, this might not be anybody's, but it's yeah, you have to put your own numbers in there. But it came out with a 238.43 break even and about $92 there potential profit. So, uh, you know, there's always risk, even though the price is up in the, in the trend and prices are up, there's always risk when you're backgrounding. You're going to put the highest price feeder cattle into a backgrounding program this fall that you have ever done before. Prices are a record high over 2014 prices. So there's always risk. Just look at the, the war happening and other things that might happen. So, you know, I still think that, that possibly you should look at price risk management. So here's uh, what was available for livestock risk protection insurance up until 830 this morning. So uh, again, the most important thing here is just what's circled in green there. So on the left, circle in green is the coverage price that uh, was offered up until 8.30 this morning. This would be for, you know, backgrounded steers, six up to uh, 1,000 pounds. So USDA offered 253.69, uh, uh, you know, right to the left of that is the expected ending value of 255. Uh, 56. How did USDA get that? Well, just go down to the bottom. Yesterday, March uh, feeder cattle closed at 255.87. And so that's that's where they got their expected ending value. But important to you then is what does it cost you? So the producer premium there is uh, uh, six dollars and you know, over six dollars, 626. So uh, you multiply that by 800 pound steer. And, you know, that's, uh, 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 you know, uh, no small change there. And, and so about a $50 bill when you just hair over $50. So if you go back up here and take off your profits on the bottom there in 92.58, you take $50 off of that for risk protection. You know, it does affect that bottom line. Again, whether you do price risk protection or not is up to you and your or between the lender and the producer and how much risk exposure you have and, and so on. But one thing kind of that I like to do is go back and look at that break even price of 238 and then compare that to the prices that are offered and the cost. And so you can see, uh, you know, I had to go down there and, and split. There's a whole bunch of prices offered, two dollars lower and uh, all the way down to from uh, 253 down to 235, but that break in the line there is, uh, again, these are for calves coming out in March uh, that would, uh, you know, this would mature on uh, March 6th and the new one out this afternoon will be one day later. But, you know, with that, with that two, uh, with that break even price there, uh, you can uh, come down there and say that one right under that white break in line there at 239.69, that's still uh, above your break even by a dollar, bring your premium down to $2. Again, this is all uh, between the lender and the producer and how much risk exposure you have and how much you want. But then that lowers your, your premium to about 18.50. So that still preserves, uh, you know, $75 profit back here on your budget. So just something to think about. Not that I'm advocating LRP over futures market options or anything else, but just giving you some alternatives because I know uh, many people just, uh, uh, you know, think maybe that I, I need the highest uh, price there. So that's the best chance of me getting paid. But again, you don't buy insurance hoping you're going to collect. Let the market go up. This is just a floor price, and uh, we don't buy insurance hoping we're collect. So just uh, kind of another way to use LRP. So with that, I am going to quit, stop sharing, and turn it over to Dave. All right. Thanks, Tim. And I just have a few comments, uh, short comments about some pretty important stuff. Uh, let me get my show started here.
us going back. So yeah, what I want to talk to you guys about today is it just passed law in the state of California uh, that mandates the reporting of greenhouse gas emissions uh, for many large companies doing business in the state. And so specifically getting to some of the details, of course, there's much more. Uh, this bill that was just signed into law by Governor Newsom mandates all public and private companies uh, with revenues of more than a billion dollars anywhere that do business in California must report their greenhouse gas emissions. And there is a, uh, a large set of accounting standards uh, around this space uh, that most of us in this space are familiar with. They have to align with, with those uh, accounting standards, those greenhouse emissions accounting standards. And they have some specific details in terms of what type of data they want then. Uh, for the state of North Dakota and for agriculture, we're really interested in the scope three. Uh, scopes one and two are either direct emissions by the company or the emissions from energy they purchase. Uh, so for example, power or heat uh, for their facilities. But scope three includes their entire supply chain, both up and downstream. And this is really important for North Dakota Ag, because this would include all of the food companies, larger food companies that do business in California that purchase uh, North Dakota crops or livestock uh, and then end up in those supply chains. Uh, a lengthy description of what has to happen. One of the things uh, that is included, the, the company itself can prepare the report, but it must have a third party uh, verify what's in the report and provide a certain level of assurance uh, that everything is correct. And again, de depending on that level of assurance. This is, to me, really quite important for North Dakota. Uh, we were expecting a, a requirement from the Securities and Exchange Commission just for public companies sometime in the coming years. And of course, California uh, just went ahead and passed the law. Important to note, you know, California is not the country, but they're a very large market. And I think it would be difficult for many companies uh, to, to lose that market or they're willing to bear those costs of providing this information uh, to maintain uh, their presence in that California market. Uh, as I mentioned before, we produce a lot of food crops, feed, livestock that are going to end up being scope three uh, for these companies. And so essentially data that reflects what we're doing in North Dakota on the farm is going to end up in those reports. One of the nice things is is that there is they're, they're, they're going to slowly move into this. Uh, if you saw on the previous slide, they're not actually even going to require any scope three emissions data until 2027. With, and they actually want 2026 data, but reported in 2027. But you only have to meet the limited assurance level, which basically said, I don't think there's anything wrong with this report, which is which is a relatively low standard as opposed to uh, you know, this all looks right. Uh, subtle, but but really important. But this kind of comes back to what is this eventually going to mean for, for North Dakota Ag? Uh, in the near term, you know, most of these companies, and again, we can just envision ourselves at uh, General Mills or Bush's Beans uh, having to report this data. What they can do, at least in the near term, is simply report industry average emissions. So they could say that we buy X many bushels or tons of barley the industry-wide emissions are X, and that's good enough, kind of, right? So that will meet the needs, at least in the, the short term with the state of California. I'd imagine that they're going to ask for more detailed information over time. But what's really important to farmers and the, the associations that are affiliated with these, these crop associations, you know, do good industry average numbers exist? Uh, most uh, crops in North America have had what's called the life cycle assessment. I've spoken about that before done to estimate that carbon footprint. But sometimes it was done by academics and sometimes the academics information uh, was not uh, as accurate in tune as what it should be. And not often cases it, it's out of date. Uh, so that, that's one concern. Also of interest is if they're not balanced correctly, right? So do the, the national numbers of these industry wide numbers really reflect North Dakota numbers or your farm's numbers. And th this case would be really important because if your farm happens to have a smaller carbon footprint, today you're not going to get credit for it, but in the future you might, going along with additional reporting. Uh, and, and those are all really important because we, we haven't gotten to this yet, but California looks like they'll be the first uh, state to really require this. And within just a few years, we are going to see 
folks pushing down through the supply chain. I've talked with a few processors and they have already gotten requests for information about their facility, which in turn would re require some sort of information from the farmers they buy from. So this is very much uh, top of the list for a lot of folks in, in food uh, in food ingredient business right now. Uh, some really quick notes, just kind of echoing what Frain had said uh, about the war in Israel and Palestine. It, it really has not caused any significant price movements. I looked at WTI just before I flipped over, and it, we're basically back to where we were a week ago. Uh, the conflict started on Saturday. We're within 50 cents of, of the, the WTI price, the North American oil price right now. Um, but that could change quickly. And of course, if we're looking at energy, and with, this would touch bioenergy, there is, there's a huge, there's a number of touch points between the conflict and oil production, oil production and energy, including bioenergy in the United States. Basically, you know, some of the bigger players, the, the top 10 of, of oil production, the United States, Russia, Saudi Arabia and Iran are either indirectly related um, or on the verge of becoming directly related in this in this situation. You know, some sort of explosion, you know, in, in terms of the 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 war, you know, expanding in scope or directly impacting oil flows or anything like that. And we could see prices change really quickly. Uh, I'm surprised, but, you know, happy to see that to, to date that hasn't been the issue. Finally, just following up, I did add this. Uh, as Brian had mentioned, uh, we do have our outlook for egg lenders next week. Uh, it's a really good uh, program. You get more in-depth coverage of a lot of topics. You'll actually get less coverage of California, their greenhouse gas emissions, because there's a bunch of stuff going on in biofuels. But if you look on the, the right of your screen, there's a, the topics we provide or, or cover during that date. A lot of time for discussion, also networking for other attendees. And you can see the dates on the left. Basically, we do a loop beginning in Grand Forks on Monday and then make it back to Fargo on Thursday. Uh, there is additional information at the link. I can put it in the the chat or, or send it to you if you'd like to see it. Right now, you'd have to do same day registration, uh, but we'd be happy to see any of you join us. Uh, and I believe that's the last of our prepared slides. Uh, we'll, we'll be meeting next month, but it is open. the floor is open for questions. If there are no questions, we wanna thank all of you for joining us today, the presenters for presenting. Uh, and again, we'll see you back on November 9th. And be careful, tomorrow is Friday the 13th in October. Bye. Mm -hmm.